Let's go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Sunday to every one of us. Today, we'll be having a very beautiful session on a very important topic, understanding industrial relations. Understanding industrial relations. Okay, we'll be looking at union and management engagement. And today, we have the privilege of having a, an astute professional, Sheyi Adegola. He has a BSc, he also has a master's, he's a member of the Tara Institute of Personnel Management. He also is, a pro, is an HR professional with very strong industrial relations background. He's a passionate driver of employee engagement because he believes in work experience. Generally, she has over 15 years career exposure as an HR generalist that in sectors that cut across banking, downstream oil and gas, telecoms infrastructure, okay, HR consulting, career and logistics. He has also had the privilege of working with an employer body or association. Currently, he is rendering his services with a manufacturing company. She is very competent and qualified to handle this course. At this point, at this juncture, it is my pleasure and privilege to hand over control to Shei. The next voice you'll be hearing right now is Mr. Shei Adebola. Over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Oluyemi, for this opportunity. And thanks to the HR mentorship um, group. So quickly, we are looking at what really is industrial relations. Um, a lot of things have happened in the unionized environment. If any of us find ourselves in such an environment, I'm sure you've had issues here and there. But the truth is, those issues can, however, be resolved better if we understand union engagement and management. I believe. We So for today, it's um, knowing what IR is, understanding the laws human unit. Then my closing charge, then we go to question and answer. Basically, this is what I have. The question is what is I have? I have is in strong relations. First, the employees, then the governments or then you have the trade unions. So the industry you operate. So then quickly we are just to see what happens in different industries. Um, this is how best we can manage this. So starting, um, I don't know if any of us are familiar with uh, union engagement. The union, there's a way Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Oli Emi and the HR mentorship community. It's my pleasure to bring to you this evening, this session. Basically, understanding industrial relations, union, and management engagement. So this is our hotline. What is industrial relation itself? Understanding the and the policies, the expectation of both sides, how to manage the union. My closing remarks, then we go to questions and um, answers. Probably we prefer a solution. So basically, what is industrial relations and who are the players in this field? We have the employees, we have the employers, we have the trade unions themselves. And we have the government, which we can be called the regulators. The regulators are the people. We have different laws that guide industrial relations practice, both globally and locally. So we are not limited to just Nigeria. We will see some other things that Nigeria have actually signed into that makes us um, party to some of these documents. So uh, as I said, um, the union normally starts each meeting with their son. And if any of us is familiar with 
the union activities and how they start. They start with their solidarity song. And let me just take um, one or two minutes to sing that song. And they start so that when you hear them sing, you won't be afraid that something else is coming. After all, I've not started the meeting. How come they are just chanting? But that is the way they regularly want to start their meeting to show their bond. And their song goes down, solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. The union make us strong. Forward, ever, backward, never. In the struggle for our members is a victory. I hear them chant, it's a little with the workers. With the workers, it's a little. Forward ever, backward never. And all that and all that. And it's so interesting when you sit with these guys and they settle down. So that's just for that. So basically in Nigeria, we have two major unions that regulates every other union. For the junior setting, it's called the NLC. I'm sure we are familiar with this. For the senior, it's called TUC. So for every union you have in your environment, the junior will automatically have their larger body covered by NLC, while the senior will have their body covered by TUC. So quickly, let me just share what some things we need to know I have it. Simply put, relationship between workers and employers, then regulators. Regulators can be the employer body or the government. Another is that union management, which basically I'm sure we know that the union most times, uh, the, the union most time represent the workers, while management represent the employers. Also, it depends on the industry or the sector you find yourself. Though with general principles, but different practices. So you can find yourself in all like gas. We have different practices. You can find yourself in the food sector, different practices, same principles. You can find yourself in the electrical sector, same principle, different practice. And majorly the goal for union basically is to strengthen the employer, the, the goal of industrial relation is to strengthen the employer-employee relationship through resolving workplace issues, providing support to the company, meaning there will be issues that must be managed. So for you as an HR professional, you don't need to fret. Know that when the issues come, your work is to manage it. So this is just typically some examples of um, unions in different sectors. For the food industry, we have the, for the junior ones, we have the NUFBT, which is the National Union of Food, Beverage, and Tobacco Employees. And for their senior counterpart, you have the Food, Beverage, Tobacco Senior Staff Association. And the employer body is the Association of Food, Beverage, and Tobacco Employers. For the online gas, you have Nupeng, I'm sure we all know, when the crisis of um, fuel scarcity, diesel, APRA, and all that. For their junior, you have Nupeng. For their senior, you have and for the body, you have an NPC. And that's where you always hear that government should come out and say something. For the non-metallic, you have nuclear, nuclear, they call it nuclear, nuclear thing. Basically, and for the maritime, and all sorts, it depends on the industry you find yourself. And the funny thing about IR is that even if your company is not unionized, you are somehow banded by whatever comes out of the union agreement. And I'm sure all of us are taking a back at that. So let me be more because of our time. And as I said before, down, these are some of the unions we have. We also have the National, the Nigerian Medical Association. I'm sure we all know of the ASU strike going on. I'm sure at one point or the other, the teachers still have their own way. And all these are under either NUC, um, NLC or TUC, as I earlier said. So what exactly do we need to understand about the laws or the policies that guide industrial relations? Number one, as HR professionals, 
they should understand that every member of our organization have the right to unionize. There are two ILO conventions that speak to this. And um, either we like it or not, Nigeria is signatory to both conventions. One is freedom of association and protection of rights to organize convention. It provides rights of workers and employers to do whatever they would they, they have the right to associate, they have the right to come together, they have the right to do all stuff under that umbrella. And the second one is right to organize a collective bargaining convention, which is um, ILO Convention 1949 and number 98. This protect workers against acts of anti-union discrimination with respect to their employment. So we should understand. Hello, sir. Sorry, sir. Yes. Somebody is asking me that what is ILO, sir? The full meaning, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, ILO is the International Labor Organization. I'm sorry. I, I'm sure that. I'll explain. ILO is International Labor Organization. Somebody ILO, is asking, sir, that what does IR mean, sir? Industrial Relations. I broke that down Thank while you. I was, yes. Industrial Relations. So, and I said earlier, Nigeria is a signatory to both conventions, which was ratified just immediately after the independence in 1960. And also, our constitution in section 40 gives rights to unionize. So, and also, we should understand some of these laws as practitioners. Employer must also avail the employees and the union all assistance for smooth operation and must not stand in the way of such unionization. So, if any of your um, staff come to say, Sir, we want to unionize. It's not for you to say yes or no. In fact, you have to actually cancel for them to understand what they're actually going into. Unfortunately for some organizations, they are better off when they are not unionized. But they won't know because of so many noise that they have been cajoled by the so-called union. Also in our labor laws, we have the Trade Unions Act of 1973 as amended which is now expressly limit deduction to actual members of the TUC. So before now, once you are a staff, junior or senior category, it, nobody cares if you're a member or not. Your, your dues is just deducted from your salary. And you ask yourself a question, why are they deducting that? So I will explain that as I go on with my presentation. Also, we need to understand that as far as our law is concerned, junior staff are deemed to be members of the union until they individually and in writing opt out. So for junior union, their entry is automatic. Once they join your organization, you start deducting automatically until an individual decides to opt out and this must be in writing. But for the senior staff, they are to opt in individually and to opt out individually. So one of the things which you be careful about too is that there cannot be collective opting out of the union. It will be seen as a sabotage of HR or management. Also, certain personnel are prohibited from forming or joining an industrial union. According to our trade unions act, which is like the member of armed forces, army, soldier, and all that, the custom, the police, and central bank of Nigeria. And that's why you see that since CBN can only protect, they can actually not go on strike because they are not members of the union, not really protecting them. And a person convicted of a criminal offense is prohibited from holding office as an official of the union. It does not stop them from being a member of the union. They cannot only be officers of the union. I hope that is clear to us. And let me just quickly go further. What are the expectations that the union will actually bring to you? And basically, that is what they are for. You want a better and more favorable working condition. Even when they are not giving their best, they still want this. They want benefits even when not end. You see union coming to you and ask for all manner of benefits. 
and you ask them, people, look at what we are going through presently. Why can we do this? We can't do this now. They also want safe working environment, which is supposed to be basically the reason for coming together. Then they want to collectively bargain. They don't want a situation where to be after your appraiser, somebody gets a very skyrocketed promotion or increase, and others are left without nothing. So they want to, they have the power to collectively bargain and sign agreements, and they also want to be recognized. Union wants to be recognized. So at times, you need to balance your ego as an HR professional to understand that when you come to the table, you are on the same level. And that's why you see that when there's meeting between management and the union, we call it, uh, we call it a plain table. There is no organ, there's no moshe. They call it union management. And basically, you can see from the material evidences, they want promotion for their members. They want fairness, they want justice, they want compensation, they want their rights to be exhibited and known. They want so many things. And the question is, as an employer, you too must have expectation of the union. They must ensure that things work out properly. And even when they are trying to make themselves relevant, you should be able to address yourself of some other things that you should know. So others, their, their expectation also, the union expect that whatever agreement is signed at any level, even when it's not cascaded to them, they want you to put this in place. One of the agreements is ILO, anything from ILO is national organization. Whatever ILO have put in place and Nigeria have ratified, they want you at the letter end to enforce it. Also, whatever agreement the union has signed, Example is the national minimum wage. The national minimum wage, where an organization is even paying, you, you, you even discover that when an organization is even paying beyond minimum wage, they come with conse um, consequential adjustment. They tell you that since minimum wage has been um, increased, though we know you are doing more than minimum wage, but there should be an adjustment to balance. Also, the union expects that you implement industry agreements, which is NGIC. NGIC is the, what we call National Joint Industrial Council. This is a council where the union alignment is like a representative body for both the employers and the employees. And also what we call the enterprise or branch agreement. In the sector I operate from, we call it this B for the seniors, and we call it appendix C. And this depends on the industry we actually operate. Also, one of the things, or some of the things the, the union also fight for is unfair labor practices, sanctity of contracts, wrongful termination, and prolonged suspension. Let me just take some of these things for our learning. I'm sure we understand that once you sign every employment letter you give or employment contract you give to an employee, it's binding either you like it or not. And at times, unknowingly or probably trying to manage expectations, we don't implement some things until after confirmation. Some of these practices are not right. Also, there is what we call wrongful termination. If you don't follow through your processes and you terminate somebody, the union can actually take you up on that. Currently, I have issues with um, some stuff in my current employment. And the union is actually some one way they are appealing, and the other way they are rejecting termination. And they said, okay, they want to escalate. I said, no problem, escalate. By the time they escalate to the next level, which is um, okay, let me quickly break it down again before we go far. For the union, you have both from the branch level, then you have to the state level, and you have to the national level. And all these are just way of escalating issues. Once you are not resolving in the branch level, they escalate to the state level. Once you can, once they can resolve in the state level, they move it to national. And at that point, you too, as an employer, need to involve your employer for the once things are getting out of band that you can no longer handle. Also, the issue of prolonged suspension. I'm sure we know a lot of um, rulings and judgment of the NIC has actually affected our what we call employee handbook or staff handbook 
So a lot of things have changed over time, which as an IR person, you need to update whoever is in charge of that to let them understand and see that. Also, the union always likes for them to be carried along, even when it's not their business. They want you to still carry them along. But again, that's part of the management and engagement we have. So and we have some factors that actually affect industrial relations. It's in the behavior. Um, for an HR practitioner or HR professional, you must understand that there is, you, you need to manage your behavior with the union. When it comes to union matter, it's no longer um, HR and other staff. It's now management and union. So you must learn to manage the union individually. It is not that the management said and you must deliver accordingly. You must be able to carry a posture where you relate the concern of the management to the union in a way that will not be seen as victimization. And the industry I find myself is so, is so interesting, let me put it that way, that they can even tell you you don't have the right to do some things. And because the NIC we have now is more employee friendly than employer oriented. So we are careful. The second thing is our organizational structure. Once you know your structure is in a particular way before you become unionized. Once you become unionized, you must adjust your structure to fit into this. Also, we have the psychological factor. The, the union do not think the way you think, especially the junior union. They think in the manner that you yourself will ask yourself, what am I doing here? Then our leadership style when it comes to these guys should be more of inclusive, um, more of persuasive and negotiation. But again, you must understand the different leadership style and the one to use at every particular time. During negotiation, you can start with whatever leadership style you have read. But at a time, at a point of your discussion, you must be very firm, very diplomatic, and you must understand exactly where you are going to. Others are probably economical issues, technical environment that we find ourselves. The, the Nigeria of today, I'm sure you know a lot of things come in and go. Also, our legal and political environment is actually not helping matters. You will find out that there are lawyers that will tell employees to go to court. At the end of the day, you will win. And so we tell you, um, so we even bring letter from the vice president. So we bring letter from the state governor. So we bring letter from the local government chairman. And they will say this is what the state law is, even because of unnecessary or unexpected influence. So um, in managing this, you must understand that engagement cannot be overemphasized. Engagement is one of the great tools to actually manage the union. You don't need to wait until crisis starts. You don't need to wait until it's negotiation time. You don't need to wait until there is an issue. If you have the might and the strength and you understand I am, you should have at least an, a quarterly engagement with the union. It doesn't have to have, it doesn't have to be when there are issues. You don't need to wait for issues to come. You don't need to just engage and keep them abreast of your happenings, what the company is looking at, how the last quarter was, what is expected in the next quarter. They will feel among, and they will feel, yes, we are, we are being recognized. Another thing we need to understand, if you empower your union, you are likely to have less trouble. What, I, what do I mean by empowerment? Send them on training. Send them on training, basically, on how to discuss issues, how to present matters how to negotiate. Don't think you are wasting your money. No, 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 no. You're only empowering them to make your life better. Enhance their capacity. Let them see a reason to grow. Let them see a reason to flow. Involve them in your regular operations. Enable them. Give them, like something happened in my organization recently, and I can tell you for free, we have to engage the union to investigate. We give them the power to nail the issue, to investigate the issue, and to report to HR. And at the end of the day, they were not able to like, ah, now what do we do? 
Because you are giving them the power to go and do what ordinarily they will not do. So that at the end of the day, they will say, okay, oh, sir, we have realized the issue. We, we know the mess up. But please, sir, what can you do? At that point, they are at your mercy. But if you have carried on to do that yourself, you may likely have issues of inception. Let me quickly move because of our time. As one of the things you understand that for every negotiation, it's a win-win situation. You don't need to just insist on whatever mandate you have. Okay, let me quickly talk about mandate. For the industry we operate, there's what we call procedural agreement. There's what we call NGIC agreement. There's what we call branch agreement. And in the industry I operate, there's renewal of that agreement every two years. And how do you renew this agreement? You come to the table, you start with discussion, and after discussion, you go into negotiation. For everybody coming into discussion and negotiation, there's what we call a mandate. A mandate is what I know I can afford from the demand, compared to the demand of the union. The union will always come with demands. They can come with 200 items demanded. Meanwhile, all you have in your kitty as mandate from management is five items. So it's during discussion, you try to prune down, you try to let them talk them into it and let them see that, guys, I can't even start with this 200. Let me have your best 50. They say, no, 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 guy, you can't do that. Let me have your best 50. I'm sure you know you have five, but you just tell them, okay, go and leave all these ones. By the time we start discussion, you see that these are not relevant. Another way you start the discussion is tell them know that some things are not relevant. They should not just give themselves a headache on it. You should understand that one particular item can actually resolve so many. In that, they will also understand. By the time they come with the 50 again, you don't go to negotiation immediately. At times in some industry, there's what we call corridor discussion. You as an HR person, you will call the ESCO, specifically the president or the chairman, the chairman of the union and the secretary, and you talk them to it. Say, guys, I know I have your 50 items for demand, but let me be sincere with you. I have just three. Well, as an HR person, as an IR professional, you must be very diplomatic. You don't play all your cards at the same time until an avenue where you trust each other to lay there and you come for discussion and negotiation. At that point in time, you let them know, I have three. But let me go back to management if I can get additional three. You extend the discussion again, another two weeks you come. I was able to get one. Let me, at that time, day two, they said, okay, we have reduced from 50 to 30. The next one, they have reduced from 30 to 20. The next one, they have reduced from 20 to 10. And now they will tell you, oh, God, we can't go down from this. And you say, okay, fine. Let me see what I can get from management too. And you already know you have five. So at the, at the end of the day, you start with 10 from here and five from here. So another way to negotiate with the union is to start big. By the time you start with the basic one, the one that they feel, this will change a lot of things. That will drag if you have a very understanding, you know, that we actually drag for a while. We have one of you without understand that the way this thing is going, I'm not sure we can get what we are struggling at. By the end of the day, you understand that at the end of the whole negotiation, it must be a win-win affair. So I said you discuss, was ready to compromise, you must be business-minded in your discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. And these things calls for skills. You must understand what they call negotiation skills. No matter how aggressive the union might be, you must understand on your side a way to calm them down. And on your own side, you must have an avenue to fire. That they will say, okay, Oga, I think at this junction we are arguing too much. Let's adjourn. Everybody will go back again and come back. And in your judgment, you already know where you are going, actually. But these are just the skills you need to know and understand. And as I said here, the union have a lot of things to collectively bargain. You can see on my left-hand side of the slide, 
Is it the health issue, the HMO issue? They can even tell you that um, work hour, international best practice, break time is no longer one hour. They can even tell you different things that um, over time rate this one. But if you are lucky to be in the kind of environment I find myself, the national already have some of this thing in place, negotiated up there. So by the time it comes to the branch level, it's just a giveaway. The other items to be negotiated at the branch level is what there are some that is principally agreed and to be negotiated in house. So it depends on the industry you find yourself actually that helps you to do this. But as I said earlier, it's the same principles but different practice. So let me go to okay. I think um, I'm running up. I have the next five minutes. I actually believe that in 45 minutes I should show my slide. So in closing, I said. HR in charge or whether it's in charge must be fair and understand as much or more than the union. You must understand every document as it relates to your industry. You must understand every document because at the end of the day, if you are not careful, the chain of negotiation, you may end up in disagreement. When you end up in disagreement, from there, you go to the states. When you don't agree at the state, go to the national. When you don't agree at the national, you go to the AIP. But in most cases, in the industry operates, we go to the Ministry of Labor. Ministry of Labor, we set up AIP, um, Industrial Arbitration Panel, where they will see your case. It's like um, bringing you guys together, both parties together, to see how they can mediate and let you go back. If that is not resolved, they move to the next level again, then you end up in court. But most time I advise my colleagues, why don't you nip it in the bud before you get that far? It's also a way to, to buy time and to get the union to your side. There's no excuse for not having full knowledge of your industry procedure agreement, labor agreement. I, I, I don't, um, let, let me be more um, civil. Um, don't mind the day you join the organization. Yesterday we had what that facilitator was telling us. It it's, it's relies on your responsibility to check whatever the industry standards are before you join. In the industry I operate, the agreement is over 40 years now. So I can't come in and say I'm new. I don't know what they signed 40 years ago, what they signed 10 years ago, or what they signed five years ago. Because it's already every two years. So probably what your predecessor left is the last five agreements, which is 10 years. And you have other courses that have been signed over time. You must, as a matter of urgency, address yourself with this agreement. Also, you must learn to network and connect with other colleagues in the same industry. This leverage platform can help you a whole lot. In fact, let me tell you another thing. A colleague of yours that is close to a union, somebody somewhere, can actually help you out to say, I have my, my friend, my friend in social company, ABC company, is having an issue with the union. And I know you are very close to the state secretary or the state chairman. Can you just intervene and let these guys just share their sword and solve this issue in three days? You'll be shocked that the next two days they call you for a meeting and say, okay, uh, we are sorry, uh, let's resolve. Whatever has happened before, let's forget about it. They have called us to behave and we are behaving. Another advice I want to give is that you must be active in your employer's body HR committee. I belong to AFBT, Association of Food Beverage and Tobacco Employers. There's what we call Committee of Personnel Experts. It's an HR committee where we discuss and relate these issues and we share bodies and you get solution from so many things that you haven't going through. In fact, at that meeting, you'll be shocked that somebody will tell you, call me after the meeting, I have the solution for this. So we must understand that even HR mentorship platform that we belong to is a solution platform. Don't, don't keep quiet and start struggling when you can actually use the network you have. Also, you must have a relationship with both the national and the state body of the union. Don't just say it's none of your business. 
You don't need to wait. You can just put the call through. It's been a while I said I should say, I, how are you, Prince? How are you, Secretary? And let me quickly let us understand that in this union setting, we have three most powerful people, the chairman, the secretary, and the treasurer. The same thing applies to the states, also the, to the national. The national, the most powerful is the president, the next powerful is the secretary, and the next powerful is the treasurer. And you'll be shocked that these guys can actually influence a lot of things. As I said earlier, organize at least a biannual meeting with your branch union, inform the union of some happenings and propose review in the organization. What we call carry them along. It is just for information. They can't dictate what you actually will do. It's just for information. And I said again, um, grant them permission as time allows to participate in the external engagement and meetings. I have it lot of excuse letter on my desk. And what I tell them is that I'm giving you this permission and you must give me something. If I send you to this meeting or this training that you people are asking for, promise me that in the next three months, nobody's coming here for anything again. You solve your issues, you resolve issues even before getting to me and we'll get it sorted as early as possible. So they will come with a lot of demands. It's not left for you to manage your structure. And um, finally, before, before I, I, I round up, before we go to the Q&A session, an HR professional office is as good as office of the union chairman for senior and junior. Don't close your door to the union when they come. The best you can do is to listen to them and tell them you'll get back to them. The more you tell them, I'll get back to you without first listening, the more you are procrastinating your issues. And I can tell you for free, the union, some can be very reasonable, some are not. It also depends on the location you find yourself. It also depends on the caliber of staff that you are working with. If you find yourself in a factory setting that the crop of your junior workers are more of full level and OND, and you find yourself in a, in, in a rural environment, I'm sure you know it's a different ball game. If you find yourself in an environment where you have even your factory operatives, a you lot know, of them are graduates, enlightened, they are engaging, they pick up conversation, you have a better deal. So at this juncture, I want to thank you, and I want to say solidarity forever for the union make us strong. Thank you. I'm open for questions, which I believe at this time it will open us to a lot of things that I've not mentioned. Will you hear me over to you? Thank you so much, Pei, for that uh, insightful session. We already have quite a number of hands up. So what I will do, I will first start from the hands we've never seen before and then go to the slightly more familiar hands. I'll be using my discretion. Okay, I'll start with Akorede Daniel. Akorede Daniel, you have been given permission to unmute. Let's be as direct as possible. Over to you, Akorede. All right, thank you so much, uh, our facilitator. It's actually an insightful session. Now, I want to ask this question. It's, it's more like a digression, but uh, it's part of employee relations uh, matter. There is actually uh, a new trend when it comes to termination of employment. I was told that, uh, though I, I saw it online, that uh, if you dismiss a staff, you must ensure that you calculate their entitlement. I don't know if I don't know how true is that. But I, I, I somebody said that it was actually an ILO convention. I yeah, it. we will first take the core matters before we can go to any other matter if there is time. Please. Okay. That, that then the second one. The second one is concerning hold on, hold on, sir. Also, all everyone asking questions, please let it be based on the subject matter for today. Thank you. You can ask on the group any random question we will answer on the group, please. Over to you, Daniel. All right. So the second one is, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, whether you are part of the union or not, you are bound, uh, you'll be bound by their, uh, by, their, uh, by their law. For example, if 
there's an uh, NGS agreement that states that a particular increment in, in, in salary for a particular year, does it mean that if you are not uh, unionized, you have to be banned by the, uh, by the NGIC agreement? Can I answer that? For a, for, a, for a factory that is not under any union, no, you, example, are not. If you are not unionized, are you binded by NGIC agreement? Okay, if you are not unionized, yeah. and nobody brings it to your desk. Yes. However, if you belong to an industry where it's unionized, yes. you, are not, you are not banned by the agreement. But the day right. any of the member brings it up, you don't have a choice. Do you understand? Um, I've already done it. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. I'll call on Oluchi. Oluchi Okonko, you have the floor. Good evening, everyone. Um, my question is um, the on the NGIC. We have situation where uh, somebody, the union you know, comes up with this document, NJIC, and you discover it is signed by. Oluchi, we can barely hear you. So you can barely hear you. Can barely hear you. Oluchi, you may need to be more audible, please. We can barely hear you. Or do you want to type the question? Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? It's better. Thank you. Okay. I, I think my laptop, the microphone, is called because I'm like. Okay, my question is on NJIC. You have this NJIC document, and you find that it's signed by some people somewhere in Lagos, and it's meant to also cover your industry or your organization. And your organization wasn't even part of the negotiation or the agreement or any, but you are now bound by. Content of the NJIC. How do you manage that? That's one. My second question is how do you manage union and community? Because you have a situation where uh, the United people, based on their community, I'm actually based in Greater State, so that's where I'm speaking from. You have the, the members of the union, many of them, especially the senior ones. They run to the union. When it doesn't suit them, they run to the committee. And the CLO is coming with their own. The client is telling me that they are our host committee. You need to listen to them. So, how do you navigate that water? Thank you. Can you please try and respond based on what you had? Okay, um, Oluchi, let, let me quickly respond. I think I had the second one better. Talking about the host community youth making um, a request. Number one, there's a difference between industrial relation and community relation. However, in some organization, the HR is the one in charge of that. Currently, in my practice, 50% of the factory workforce are from the community. So one of the things we do is to channel everything through the KBC. So if there's any need for anybody, they go to KBC. In fact, in my very short period, I have received over five requests from the KBC because there has been an agreement that whatever anybody wants in the community must be channeled to the KBC. So your whoever is in charge of your community relation must give you the best strategy to use to combat this. If you find yourself in the Niger Delta setting, I'm sure you know how to do these things better. In that place, the, the youths are so funny that they can tell you they don't want a particular HR person. Remember sometimes in Calabar, they insisted in one of the theories that they don't want a Yoruba HR, that the HR must be from their place. It was managed over a year, and the HR was gradually replaced. There's also an, uh, an organization that I know, they are into distill, distillaries, they are into distilling. 
they don't take as a matter of policy, the HR manager must come from Niger Delta. The higher manager must come from Niger Delta. So that is the way they view their home. But on the NGIC, I, 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 I can tell you, I could barely hear you. But for any NG, NGIC agreement that is signed, you are binding. However, can discuss with your branch union on your terms of implementation. For example, in the food industry, the current agreement will expire next year, December. Some organizations may not be able to afford payment at December. So they talk to their branch union to say, we have this agreement. Currently, we are bleeding. We cannot afford to implement now. In three months time, we're going to implement this agreement. Some will tell you we will backdate the agreement. Some will tell you, please understand with us, we will implement from social period. So every NGIC agreement depends on affordability of the organization. However, if your branch union is not understanding, you must find a way to implement that agreement one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll go to Micah. If you have any questions, please raise up your hand, please. Micah, please kindly ask Good evening, Good evening, sir. Good evening. I, um, thank you for this um, session. I want to ask you, uh, in the beginning, when he started, he said, if you are, you have two set of union, the junior and the senior union uh, in an organization, and uh, as soon as you are hired during the documentation process, and you are a member, you automatically become a member of the junior uh, union. Is this practice, um, is this a standard in our organization or is it practice in all organizations? That's also just, I just want to know about it. Michael, is it law? It's not a practice. Michael, is it law? It's not a practice. You can check that out, in, but with, with the current labor law is being reviewed. I can actually check that out. Also, some of these things are not expressly defined in some of the documents you read. But by the time you see some NIC judgments, it becomes clearer to you. And by the time you see some judgments, especially one of the judgments you can read, you can avail yourself with, is Belozzi versus NUABT, where Belozzi was saying that they have the right to tell who to be union or not, and they went to court. And the court told them straight, expressly, you do not have the right to determine who belongs to the union in the junior category. Once they come in, they're automatically members of the union. So Michael, you need to understand that. Then you need to understand the industry you find yourself too. That's very important. I hope I answered that question. Thank you so much, um, Shay. For that, well, yeah, I mean, there are some questions in the chat box too. Yeah, just be before we go to the chat box, let's just exhaust um, the people who want to ask questions. Yetunde, ask me to you. Yetunde, please. Once we take Yetunde, we'll go back. Okay. Good evening. Please okay. go ahead. Can you hear me? Louder. Okay. All right. Oh, all right. Good evening. Thank you so much for this. Um, session it's just like a i'm not i don't really have much questions they're just like a, a short contribution to it because yes i i've worked in a unionized um environment before this time around i'm part of the union not even an hr but i was the administ administrative secretary for um uh, let me say that asu so, and I can really say, yes, like you said, that the, the people that have power in the union um, setting within the, uh, what's it called, is um, the um, chairman, the secretary, and the treasurer. But I must say that most times people overlook some of the other executives in the union. For example, in my home setting, that uh, I know before um, any matter has been brought, at, at least, yes, they want to fight a war. Let me just put it that way. They want to cause trouble, fight a war. What we do is we bring out all documents, as in every document, we, we scrutinize it so well that 
even if the, for example, the rector is about to bring anything up, there's a document backing it up already. So at times, you know, they get ready. So, um, I, and I noticed that people overlook some of people like, uh, let's say, internal auditor, uh, um, what's it called, the welfare officer. They try to overlook them, but most times, these people, they, they, are, also, they are also the ones, uh, let me see, how would I put it? Uh, um, pushing uh, um, opinions to the to the chairman because at times some of the chairmen they don't even consult all other all they don't need to call all of their other nine executives because most times they have nine executives they don't need to call them all all they just need to call is their core person maybe like um, uh, uh, what's it called the um, general secretary that will sign the documents and um, maybe an internal auditor a welfare person and and things are come up so uh, during negotiation please they, they don't, don't 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 just focus on just the chairman or just the general secretary yes those are the core people but also try to look through to those who underneath push push things push things out to to this chairman or to this uh, 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 um, union they, they push more because these people they tend to listen to them more than even what other uh, um, what's it called around them says so and also if you are going to be facing union please make sure you read through every document that you have every law that is guiding that particular document because they will show they always show come prepared the short comes so prepared. So thank you for doing. You may, may remember my past job. So that's why I had to just comment. Thank you for this thank night. You. Thank you. <laughs> so interesting. We call them opinion leaders. Thank you so much, Yetunde. All stakeholders matter. On a lighter note, even though it's very bad to this context, it's like you go to an organization and you treat this PA or secretary with this day just because you have relationship with the CEO. You may be shocked that there are many times where CEO will ask the secretary that, should we do this or not do that? Because they will do some rapport. So take care of the so-called gatekeepers. Just to further add to what you have said, don't also forget that the president does not just become the president. Probably the president used to play a more junior role in the air school. So when you undo for you them. to speak junior officers in the ESCO right now. In the future, when they become the main leaders, they'll remember how you have accorded them respect over the years, and they will be more agreeable. Very nice point, Yetunde. All right, Shay, you can please look through the questions in the chat box and respond one after the other. Okay, somebody asked, um, does company have the right to accept or reject union in their system? The, the answer is no, you cannot reject union. You can only help them to, to, to put themselves together better in a way that it will not affect you. And um, I, I need to also point out that it's not for HR to interfere in union activities. In fact, in some organization, you have union office inside the company where they have time to meet. It's, it's, you just give them a room where they have time to meet, where they have their documents. It's like their own branch secretariat. Inside, if you work in the factory, find the factory. You work where probably your office is different from the factory. These things are happening like that and you must just help to see that you are not frustrating the union. Also, you must be careful in the way you administer disciplinary actions to union executives so that it will not be seen as victimization. That is why we encourage HR leaders, HR practitioners to document every step of issues. Don't say because I want to give you a warning letter and I just say because you are a union chairman, I say I forgive you on your but because as it be. The day a bigger issue will happen, you won't have time to really go through and again, all this issue of unlawful termination, unlawful dismissal, and all that, if you have your records over time, it will give you a good backup to exiting anybody. But we must always be careful the way and manner we attend to these union executives when it comes to supplying measures. However, you must not compromise the organization policy and standard. That is very key. That is very key. Also, I have a question here. Some organization paycheck up dues instead. 
Yes, um, bad practice. Some of us just pay check of dues. There are people who are not, you know, nice. They are just, I know of an organization as I talk to you, they pay big check of dues, but you can never hear that there's anything like union in that place. I'm sure some of you know those organizations. So, but it's actually not a good practice because at times the union also have the advantage. Let me quickly take us to this advantage. The, how many of us remember the time of um, um, excise duty on carbonated drinks? I can tell you for free, the junior union in the food sector played a very big role by reducing that quantum from the original 15 naira per liter to 10 naira that you have now. You can imagine the union played a very vital role because they know that once this thing goes up, there might be issues of redundancy that will affect their staff. And they don't want to lose check off. And I can tell you for many of us that have one time or the other been in the union, I'm sure you know union is enjoyment, except when there are crises. Union is enjoyment. Also, another question, but why are some organizations not unionized? Well, um, you can't force anybody to do anything. It depends on the kind of people that you find there. Some organizations are so comfortable that they know when they unionize, their benefit will be reduced, as I said earlier. Some organizations currently do far better than industry agreements, far better than industry practice. By the time you bring in union, I'm sure you know they are losing. Like in an organization I know, before now, they have a clean wage. They don't have a big payroll composition like basic, transport, housing, utility, and over time. They just have one pay. And by the time that one pay is what they used to compute gratuity, leave allowance, 13 months, pension, everything. By the time the union came in, they had to divide this claim wage by different things. And the only thing about NGIC agreements is that most of those increases focus on basic. So everything now comes on basic. And when they got their first leave allowance after being unionized, they regretted being unionized. Imagine somebody getting 10% of, um, let's say, 100,000 before, which is 10,000. And by the time they put basic at 50%, and others at 50%. You start getting 10% of 50,000, which is 5,000. And I was opportune to be part of that discussion. And they said, okay, sorry, uh, we need your advice. What do you think? I said, you should have stayed where you were before you joined the union. Unfortunately, it's an industry agreement. There's nothing you can do. And they said, wow, we'll think better next time. And that is it. So another question is, is the staff, is the staff have the right to sue the organization in the case they deny them from rights? Yes, they will sue you because you are actually acting against the law. You do not have the right to deny them of any association. The, the law is clear. Both the constitution of Nigeria, the legal law, and that nobody can stop anybody from organizing or unionizing or forming association. So, and if they sue you, you will lose gallantly. What is NGIC agreement? NGIC agreement is basically the industry agreement of where you find yourself. What percentage do they deduct? Most time is 3% of basic. Am I answering the question one after the other? What is the percentage that has been deducted from pay? It's 3% of basic in some industry. Depends on the industry you find yourself. Um, in the courier industry, I think it's 2% because their industry, their, their union is not that strong. If the organization actually have your staff with them, some of these union activities are actually not so what you worry yourself about. But the courier industry, I think it's 2 to 5%. It, again, it depends on the size of the organization. Some does do a one-off. To say okay, this is the organization, this is what they are expected to pay. But in the industry where I belong, it's three percent of busy. I enjoy working with the unions, even though they always have bad eggs among them. Yes, 
those bad eggs can actually be handled if you follow through our discussion tonight. Okay, let me quickly let me uh, let me quickly check through again. How do you handle those community with the youth repeatedly making requests? I've told you. Is either you have a community relationship person, or your higher out team takes up that. If you find yourself in the Niger Delta, your host community leaders are actually the ones to go through. They will help you out in that manner. My question on the union and community is this. The union members swing between, yes, especially when the union schools are from that community, we will always use the community to frustrate you. And the national is asking you not to honor community. How do you manage this? You need to manage it very well. Um, if you find yourself in a very hostile community, I'm telling you, you need to find a way to manage this. Number one, your leadership style will come to play. The leadership style will come to play. In some organizations, you need to go from the bottom up. In some, you need to go from the up down. If the community don't respect their leader or their KBC or their OB or anything, that means you don't need to go from up. You, you start your routing from the down and gradually you get them together. Also, it's not everything that is formal. In the, in, in the organization where I work, it's, it's, it's in a community where, in fact, I ask myself, HR is big deal. At times on my way home, I see some of these guys sitting in the joints. And I come down from my car and I stay with them for two, three, four, five minutes. And at times I pay from my pocket to say, Mama, take this 5,000, whatever they take. This is my support. Those are gradual and stylish way. Industrial relation is about relationship. So your relationship to has something to play. And as we always say, the God factor. Don't go to a meeting believing you have what those guys have. I'm not sure there is a born again union. I said we are starting, we will start having one tomorrow. The way they come to you so aggressive, so you must have your own alternative power to handle it. Where I find myself before I meet the union, I play very well. At times when they are with me, I even speak in tongues just to find a way to help myself. So I'm sorry I have to bring that in. I'm sure we all have a way to enhance our capacity and capability to engage with these guys. So the, the last question I have here, because I'm trying to talk, if my company workers are not unionized, are you saying automatically the junior workers are unionized by law? No, they are not. But they are ready to form an associate. Don't even encourage them to do it. Even when you find yourself in the industry that's unionized. I'm telling you, you have peace, Akim. You have peace when you guys are not unionized. Except you know yourself that your, your management or your, your organization are having sharp practices. As an HR person, you are not able to correct. And I can tell you, this is another way the union is helpful. The union can help you correct some anomalies in a system that is not doing the right thing. So only I me, mean, I think that's all I have. Thank you. I okay. hope I was able to answer as expected. Thank you so much. I just have a few things to say, to contribute um, to, to this topic based on my own experience and exposure to. Now, I'd like to talk to our colleagues. I know there are some people here, the organization is not currently unionized and may not be unionized in the immediate future. But there are some values and concepts you can take away and you should learn. Because when certain matters go to court at the end of the day, the court sometimes will check, did you consult with the workers? Did you engage with the workers? You cannot now tell the court that, oh, we don't have junior. So there is something, and this is like a concept typically popular in, in Europe, they call it workers' council. Workers' council, where you have like a cross session of employees. It may be five people, seven people. Of course, you make sure that it cuts across maybe various departments, various demography, and diversity, you know, gender. What are you trying to do? As management, 
as HR, for example, when you come up with a new policy, this your ad hoc workers council that you have set up or considered by yourself, you run things through them. What are you doing? You want to make sure there's a principle we call fair hearing in disciplinary issues. There's also fairness in other aspects of HR. Sometimes as management, we may be slightly myopic, and I'm using the word myopic with respect now. Anybody can be myopic. Myopic here just means you are too focused on certain parameters at the expense of some other parameters. So I'm not saying it in a derogatory manner. So if, for example, you want to introduce a new policy, you, you call this workers council that you have selected carefully. There are some opinion leaders you, you know in your organization, you add them there, they are, you know, let me use social media language, influencers in the organization, you, you, you add them so that you say, oh, this is the draft policy. You'll be shocked that they may pick one or two legit holes in the policy and even give you alternate suggestions or recommendations. They may also tell you to add some things you are not thinking about. So I'm just putting this out there that even if you don't have union, what is union supposed to do in some instances is to counterbalance, to ensure that we have a 360 degree look with respect to issues in the, in the, in the organization. Again, it's very fundamental that as an HR person, whether you have union today or you will have union in the future, please, I need we HR people not to hate union, not to look at union members with disdain, not to perceive them as troublemakers. Like Sheye Adegbola mentioned from the beginning of this training session, they are integral part of the employment cycle of the labor market. When we say labor market, we have stakeholders like the government, we have stakeholders like the workers, we have stakeholders like organized private sector. One of these days, hopefully, we'll bring Wally Smart to this platform so that we can also learn about the organization's part. There is, we can't call it union now, we call it association. Yeah. Again, employers consultative association. Because as employees in different sectors are discussing, employers too are discussing. So that by the time we are addressing the unions, we have like a slightly uniform or near uniform approach. We know organizations are richer than each other, even though you are in the same sector. But the poor companies can talk to the richer one that please don't stretch this thing beyond this thing. Think yeah. about me. Let's look at a midpoint. Okay. So I need us not to see them as bad people because sometimes, and I'm saying this very respectfully. I've been on interview panels for HR people and you ask them a question about union, Cheyi, and they speak almost completely derogatory about yeah. union. Yeah. If, yeah. if you speak to any top-notch HR person that has international exposure, knows about international labor organization, that would be a red flag. Big one. Yeah. So unions are neutral. Don't see them as good or bad. But when you deal with them, professionally, she gave a brilliant strategy. You send them on training. They will treat you based on their knowledge. You send them on, on, on quality training. Only me. Only me. Go ahead, my brother. Go ahead. You go. Um, last week, the union, had, two weeks ago, they had a training in the Badon State Organized. You know what the chairman told me? He said, it's in Yoruba. Omote ko, luma agbili te kota. Ogate bati lowa, awala madaliru. Hey, mm -hmm. you know what I see? Hey, you know, 500,000. And that's shock, you know? Immediately, I just took please my... Please say it in English, please. Say it in English. Okay, the, the meaning is that the child you do not train mm -hmm. is the one that will sell the house you built because exactly. you did not train the child. In, in, in reference is that if I don't train them to know better, they will not flow the way I know how to... They, I want them to flow. So if I train them on training, they will be more exposed. They will be more knowledgeable. They will know it's not about banging the table or fighting. They will come and present their matter and they will wait until it is resolved. No down to, no fight, nothing. And right there, I said, send me the details. I just told my MD, we need to do this. I need your approval. 
next day. And I said, don't let this happen again. The training is on Friday. You are coming on the Wednesday. He said he forgot that he just reminded me. And after they came back, the guy said, you are no more my boss. You are now my leader. That's what they told us. So that actually changed a lot of things in the last couple of um, days. Even when things are hot, he said, okay, I can't face you. I already promised you in 90 days, it's free. So he, he could not do anything. He had to say, sir, let the state come and meet you. I can't face you. So I've escalated the matter to state. And even when they come, you won't see me. So that I won't betray the trust and the agreement I had with you. And for me, that is peace of mind. Union can help you if you want them to help you. And that is true. Let me please continue. Thank you. Okay. So that's, that's very fundamental that you carry. So let me give you an example of a matter you need to carry workers along, even if you're not unionized, so that you can be safe. Imagine you want to downsize workers. Maybe you have 300 staff. You now need to lay off, say, 50 people, 100 people. Don't say that just because you're not unionized. You will just HR or management will just arbitrarily determine who to go. It may be good to have a town hall meeting with all the staff. And then you start from what the problem is. This is hypothetical. Before January 2022, we were making 10 million naira per month. Since February, we've been experiencing a steady decline in our revenue. This is September 2022. Our revenue is now 2 million naira. Our wage bill in January was. 8 million naira. In September, our age bill, wage bill is still 7 million naira. Ladies and gentlemen, our current revenue is 3 million naira. Can we be able to pay for this wage bill? Can we sustain it? Can we afford it? Guess what the staff will say? They will be to want to chorus and respond mm. that this is not sustainable. Then you will not even ask them, what do you think we can do? Two or three options will come out or more. One, you may be shocked. They can bring brilliant ideas that will bring revenue in the short term or long term. I have seen, Shei, you know, in 2008, sorry, it's a long time, but I want to quote something I, I, I was, I'm very familiar with. There were many organizations were laying off because of the global economic meltdown of that era. An organization did what I just said. They did a town hall meeting. They were actually planning to lay off staff. She, guess what the staff said? The staff told the MD, HR, and management, can they excuse them for 30 minutes? They excused the staff. 30 minutes later, they sent for the management. Do you know what the staff told the management? She, they said, please, don't sack anybody. Reduce everybody's salary proportionally mm -hmm. to what you can pay. So, for example, somebody that was earning 300,000 naira before said, turn my money to 150. Somebody that was the one who to say, turn my money to 75. Don't sell anybody. Guess what? They preserved everybody's work and they reduced the wage bill. By 18 months later, she, things had flipped. Not only did the company now begin to do so well, guess what? She, they now even paid the arrears. Mm, that they were owing. That they were owing. Now, the staff didn't ask, oh, but things got so better that. The in trenches they, and they cleared all the areas. But imagine if they didn't engage with the staff, they just unilaterally say, Okay, we have 200 staff, sack 80. Even the 120 you didn't sack. Don't forget that people form friendship at work. They'll yeah. be really bad. Then they will now begin to look for a job, not knowing if this redundancy is stage one. Maybe that will be phase two and phase three. Do you understand? So, employee engagement and consultation is also good from that perspective. Of course, if you are unionized, of course, you have to meet with the union, show them the facts and, and the figures, and uh, engage with them. Let me just drop this last uh, strategy, say if you will permit me. Now, don't let me use SAC. It may not be a good example. Let me use, for example, we want to do salary increment. If you know that you want to increase salary increment by 20%, when you call the union, don't tell them you want to increase by 20%. Tell them, this is an example, okay? It depends on your setting and your situation. Tell them you want to increase by 10%. The union will now negotiate and say something like, 
No, let's do 50%. You will now drag, drag, drag. You will now come to maybe 18% or 20%. You will now settle there. If you give them your best offer from the beginning, you will put yourself in a situation where you will not be able to give them concession. Uh -huh. Shehi Adegbola said something powerful. You want to help the union members to save face. You want them to be able to brag to their members to say, look, we fought for you. Again, let me flip it. If you actually need to sack 100 people, I'm just saying this, due to economic situation, start from 200. They will now, you now do back and forth, back and forth. You will now reduce it to 100. It will now look like it was the union that fought and preserved the job of 100 people. These are just hypothetical examples. Olu Yemi. Everybody, please. Olu Yemi. My brother. You are right, though. And, and I'm sure you know better. <laughs> what happened in that place we both worked? When, when you came after I left? Yeah. I'm sure you saw some things that yeah. when you saw it, we reduced from like 5, 5, 540 to like 350. Mm. You know, we started in a way that that was what actually brought about the union. So we're not telling the union was not the one giving us who are not performing well that we mm. should exit. Mm. <laughs> we gave them the power to say, everybody in your department, give us names of people you think are not optimal. And that's how we started. Also in the industry where I practice, there's what they call redundancy agreements. Yeah, yeah. We know where we are going to. But you will write to the union to say, we are exiting 200 people. You give them different category without names. You just tell them in this department, this department. You now say, no, 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 no. First of all, go and cut it. You After two weeks, you cut it. Of course, you know you have a 90 days window to execute your plan. After two weeks, you cut it to 100. They come again. Oh, well, you can't pay this. You know we have an agreement. But you're actually going to 50. They will not be doing it. Call the people who come, let's go, let's go then. You will not say, okay. They will not approve 75. You will not say they have tried from 275. So you yourself, you have 25 as backlog. If at all you have anything to do in the future. So you already have an agreement to exit 75, which originally you are looking at 50. So if redundancy needs to come by the virtue of upgrade in facility or machine and all that, you already know you don't need to go back to ask for another 25. You already have that 25 in your kitty. So that's a very big strategy. Somebody is asking a question on the chat box. Please go ahead. It's and not, answer. Yes, it, it's not the failure of HR that brings about union. I, I beg to disagree. It's not the failure of HR that brings about union. Union is just there. Once people realize that their industry is covered, just want to take advantage of the cover. So it is not, I'm, I'm not sure any of us are failures here, at least in the last one year, that I know how active HR mentorship platforms are. From all these series of engagements, if there's nothing you are even trying to do, I'm sure by the time you search for issues you are going through on that WhatsApp platform, you will see an answer somehow, either in the last two years or the last one month. Or, you would have seen something relevant to what you are looking for. So it's not due to reach out failure that you just bring up. I disagree. The other person said, um, well, government and union is another board game entirely. Don't let us go there. The ASU government issue is another board game. And I'm not sure we want to find ourselves in that situation. Every organization should be a member of NECA and attend their meetings. The off pro bono services, okay, the offer pro bono services. Okay, perceived failure of management, I disagree. Okay, um, that's all, really, thank you. Okay, so before we call it a wrap, is there any other question maybe based on the last 10 minutes or more, or maybe a question just came to your mind, you can raise up your hand. We still have about eight minutes. We are wrapping up by 8.30 latest. Okay, so if there is no question, I will end the session. Then we will not throw it to any other random HR question, but we won't capture that in the recording. I hope you, you understand that. 
All right. So, um, okay, before we, yeah. on the final notes, yes, please. I want to encourage um, my colleagues, especially those on this platform, that your relationship with the union is as important as your relationship with the management. Your success as an IR person is a very big KPI for you. Some organizations actually have zero crisis as KPI for hire. Example of such company is MDC. They will give you whatever you think you need. Just make sure there's no union crisis. So let us take advantage of the platform we belong to harness whatever opportunity we have and ensure zero conflict organization. Thank you, Oluyemi. This is well appreciated. We hope to see more of ourselves as the session and other sessions go on. Thank you.